So far, we had three amazing presentations. And this is not time for the last presentation. And also, please stay here after the fourth and last presentation because we're going to have discussion panel to discuss all of these things since this morning, uh, 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 including the, the neuro, uh, neuro, neurologic uh, uh, or, or neuro ICU cases that are quite relevant. So our fourth and last presenter of today is Professor Alison Tong, who has come all the way from Australia to uh, share with us uh, uh, some of the important data. In our field, when it's about patient-centeredness, the name Alison Tong is quite important. It's, it's a pioneering ex, uh, name. So Dr. Tong is, principal, is a principal research fellow at Sydney School of Public Health, the University of Sydney. She holds an Australian um, National Health and Medical Research Council Career Development Fellowship. She has experience in patient-centered outcome research in chronic kidney disease and other areas. And she's the uh, uh, co-founder uh, and uh, uh, main or leading investigator in the Global Standardized Outcomes in Nephrology, S-O-N-G or SONG. And I have myself highlighted some of the important findings related to the SONG study. So please join me to welcome Dr. Tom. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Kotanko for the opportunity to come and present about the Song Initiative um, because of a chance meeting that we actually had in San Diego last year. And I think there's somewhat of an advantage presenting on the last day because I know I'm presenting to a very engaged and enthusiastic and committed audience. So I'll be giving a presentation on the Song Initiative, and unlike Dr. Schertau yesterday, I will not be doing any singing. Um, so to begin, I will cover um, kind of three areas. I'll give you a bit of a background to the Song Initiative, the process that's undertaken to develop what's called core outcome sets which has been mentioned in a couple of talks over the past um, couple of days already, and also a little bit about implementing these core outcomes into trials. So firstly, the background and process. Why the need for core outcomes? And again, some of the reasons have already been mentioned at this meeting. So the first one, probably quite obvious. You know, we conduct a lot of trials to improve outcomes, to improve care for patients with chronic kidney disease, but if we do trials that don't actually report outcomes that are relevant to the end users, predominantly the patients and the clinicians, it's very difficult to inform shared decision making. So we did a review, and I'm going to focus more um, on examples in dialysis given the theme of the conference. We looked at 362 trials in hemodialysis. And only 20% of these trials reported mortality, which I'm sure we all in this room agree is an important outcome. 12% report cardiovascular disease. And we know that dialysis impacts quality of life in patients, and it's really an important issue for them, but only 9% of trials report quality of life. And it's interesting, I mean, this problem isn't just unique to nephrology. It's been identified in other areas as well, and I put up a couple of examples of papers there. So this issue has been recognized in rheumatology, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, across all different medical specialties. And one statement in this paper, it says, important outcomes are not assessed. It has little relevance in real-world settings, and researchers often do not assess the effects of interventions in terms of the functional, social, and emotional well-being, or adverse reactions and long-term outcomes. The second, oh, I also want to highlight from the systematic review, I know it's a little hard to read the snail diagram, but around the circle are the list of outcomes that are reported in trials in hemodialysis, and it's plotted on a log scale ordered by frequency. And just to highlight, so the red are the surrogate outcomes. So what you see in red are the biochemical endpoints. The green are the clinical outcomes, such as mortality, cardiovascular disease. And the blue are the patient-reported outcomes, which are defined as outcomes that reflect how patients feel and how they function. 
And just to note there is that there's very little blue. The top five most frequently reported outcomes are phosphate, dialysis adequacy, anemia, inflammatory markers, and calcium. Only 14 or 17 percent of these domains were patient reported outcomes. And I thought I'd show you this graph here, also taken from the Song hemodialysis stream, where we plotted the mean difference in the priorities for outcomes between the health professionals and also the patients. So the dots lying on the left of the graph, they're the outcomes favored by the health professionals. The ones on the right are favored by the patients. And just to point out here that almost consistently across, again, all the song streams for hemodialysis, uh, peritoneal dialysis, transplant, kids, hospitalization and mortality uh, is always favored by the health professionals more than the patients. So then the second issue is that without a common outcome measure, it's very difficult to compare the effects of interventions across trials. So we identified 81 different outcome domains, but there were over 10,700 different measures used to assess these outcomes. And finally, resources are wasted when outcomes are measured and reported inconsistently. So mortality, we think that's quite straightforward, but it was reported in 48 different ways. Cardiovascular disease, similarly, reported in 47 different ways. So the aim of the SONG initiative is to establish core outcomes, particularly for trials across the whole spectrum of chronic kidney disease. And just to define this, a core outcome set is an agreed, standardized set of outcomes that should be measured and reported as a minimum in all clinical trials in a specific area of health. And this uh, definition is from the Core Outcomes uh, Measures Effectiveness Trials. It's the common initiative based in the UK. And just to note that these core outcomes are to, are to be included in trials on the basis of their importance to patients and clinicians. It's important for their decision making, even if the intervention may not be expected to make a difference. And of course, trialists can add other outcomes that are relevant for the intervention. So where we're at at the moment, so we do have a number of streams that are active. So we're looking at core outcome sets for hemodialysis, for pediatric um, kidney disease, <coughs> transplantation, PD, glomerular, di glomerular disease, and polycystic kidney disease. And we have sort of unofficially started a stream for chronic kidney disease, so for patients without, who are not yet requiring kidney replacement therapy. So across these, we've, um, the initiative started early 2015, and there's been 9,000 um, people that have been engaged in this process, including 4,000 patients and caregivers, and 5,000 health professionals from around 100 countries. And the various surveys um, that we've done have been conducted in four different languages. So in terms of the process, it is based on the WHO validated um, framework, which Comet has developed to establish core outcome domains. So it involves a systematic route to look at what outcomes are currently reported in trials, normal group technique, where this allows patients and caregivers to identify and prioritize outcomes, stakeholder interviews, a Delphi survey to reach consensus on those critically important outcomes, and then a consensus workshop. And after this first tranche of work, there's further work that needs to be done to look at, well, how do we actually measure these, to develop the core outcome measures. Follows a similar process, but there's a need to pilot <coughs> and also validate the measures. So I'm going to take you through a couple of these steps and looking at um, identifying and defining the outcomes that are of importance to patients. So we use what's called the nominal group technique, and this is a really um, effective kind of approach to identify, prioritize outcomes, but also to understand the reasons for patients' priorities. So there's a couple of steps involved. First, there's a focus group where there's some facilitated discussions about patients' general experiences of living with the condition as well as um, treatment. Then there's a kind of structured process where we ask we go around and we ask patients to identify and generate outcomes that are important to them. We generate this on the list, and then we actually add to the list outcomes that were reported from the systematic review. 
and we have some discussions to define the outcomes to make sure that we're all on the same page. We print off this list and we ask patients to rank the top 10 most important outcomes, important for decision making, that they think should be reported in trials. And then we have some group discussion about the individual's top three choices. Again, just to get a sense of why there might be similarities or differences in their choices. So this is taken from the hemodialysis normal to group technique, where the first top prioritized outcome was fatigue. And some quotes to illustrate, if I'm overwhelmed with fatigue, I have no quality of life, so why continue treatment? The following was resilience or coping with dialysis, the ability to travel, having dialysis free time, which may explain some of the results from the time trial, uh, impact on family, ability to work, sleep, anxiety, stress, drop in blood pressure, and lack of appetite. Related to dialysis free time, it's nice to have two days off on a weekend where you don't dialyze. That's my one biggest issue with dialysis. You can't take a holiday from it. With every other stressful job, you've got that to look forward to. Mortality came in at 14th. So it was really interesting, and it was quite specific to the hemodialysis group, where they talked about survival and mortality uh, quite differently. So mortality was about death, but survival had a different meaning. They said survival for me is day to day, death is long term. <coughs> Survival's got to do with coping and riding through the ups and downs, your emergencies, getting out of them to survive again. Now the patient said, well, because we haven't died yet, but we do experience the other things. Longevity is quality of life until death. And there were four themes that underpinned their choices and their priorities. So when they were looking at these outcomes, they thought about, well, what outcomes would enable them to live well? You know, you could have half a dozen measurements that hold important implications, phosphate, potassium, calcium, but they have no day-to-day -day implications, none whatsoever, for our physical or our experience of well-being. They also considered the severity and intrusiveness of the outcome in their lives. I wish there wasn't so much cramping. That just knocks the stuffing out of you. Last time it was my calves and my inner thighs. I was cramping all night long. I can hardly walk today. And then the ability to control these outcomes was also considered. So the reason vascular access potassium phosphate may not be prioritized as highly is because we as patients can't control these. We depend on our doctors. The interdialytic weight gain is high on us because that's on us. We can control that. Another patient said, well, I was given this graph about mortality that some doctor had made. I was supposed to read it and understand it. To me, it didn't really matter. Death doesn't really phase me. It's out there, but let's just face what's here. And finally, relating to uh, outcomes that were tangible and something they experienced. It's hard for us to sit here and say, well, this blood level or that blood level, the doctors tell you about it, it is objective, but you don't necessarily experience it. And I thought I'd also give you the example of the normal group technique we did um, with patients in, on PD and their caregivers. So for patients, you can see on the left are the top um, 10 prioritized outcomes. So uh, PD infection, fatigue was also quite high up there. <coughs> Mortality, flexibility with time, ability to work. And for caregivers, mortality, uh, PD infection, fatigue, blood pressure, and PD failure. And it's quite interesting, again, another pattern noted is that caregivers or their family members um, involved in their care often give higher priority to mortality than patients. And again, a couple of quotations. So because without that flexibility with time, energy, and mobility, you're really just sitting at home not doing anything. You have no energy, you're not able to go and do whatever you need to do, like access to social things and so forth, or to work or whatever. I was close to giving up dialysis last year because I was on bags during the daytime. I just couldn't work, it was driving me nuts. So you can see patients really do have a focus on the impact that outcomes have, not just in terms of symptoms, but also how it affects their overall lifestyle and their ability to live well. So the next part is around, so we've identified a range of outcomes that are important to patients, but it's about achieving consensus 
among patients but also with health professionals on what are those critically important core outcomes. So we use a Delphi survey to do this. And this is a multi-round online survey. So initially, we identify the outcomes from the prior phases of song through the systematic review through the normal group technique, and we put all of these outcomes into the survey. These are grouped into uh, domains and reviewed by the relevant um, steering committee. Then it's piloted. So this is, again, the example from hemodialysis where we had 34 outcomes in round one. We asked patients to rate the importance of outcomes on a nine-point Likert scale, which reflects the grade scale. So just keeping in mind that the rating seven to nine means that that outcome is of critical importance. They're asked to provide comments and to suggest any new outcomes I think I'm missing. So based on a certain threshold, by mean or median, we, exclude, we excluded five outcomes, and in round two, we brought through 28, 29 outcomes. Now, what's unique in this round is participants can see their own score. It's highlighted, their previous score in round one. They get to review the distribution of scores by patients, by health professionals, and overall distribution. They're asked to read the comments that um, participants have provided and to re-rate the outcomes after reflecting on these da um, data. And similar process in round three, but we also add what's called a best worst scale. So we don't only look at the absolute importance of the outcomes, but we also look at the relative importance of the outcomes. And based on the means, uh, the median score, the best worst scale, and also the proportion of participants in both groups ranking it to be critically important, we take this through to a consensus workshop to discuss and finalize the core outcome set. So in the hemodialysis Delphi survey, we included uh, 1,181 participants in round one and sustained a 71% response rate. And participants were from 73 different countries. So for this survey, we only, had it, we only conducted it in English. And here are the results. So for patients and caregivers, <coughs> the top ones were dialysis adequacy, ability to travel, vascular access problems, dialysis free time, cardiovascular disease, fatigue, feeling washed out after dialysis, blood pressure, anemia, ability to work, and just to show you where death sat, it sat at number 11. So for health professionals, vascular access problems, cardiovascular disease, death mortality, drop in blood pressure, ability to work, fatigue, hospitalization, infection, dialysis adequacy, and blood pressure. And it was interesting when you look across the rounds, for patients, seven outcomes had increases in scores, and health professionals uh, increased scores for 16 of the outcomes. And I show, I've shown you this graph before, but just to go into a little bit more detail. So you can see ability to travel was really important to patients and caregivers compared with health professionals. And some of the comments made in the survey, patients said, travel, even locally, it lifts one up and makes the patient stay involved and interested in life. I really do want to be able to travel. Before seeing the results, I thought there was no chance anyone would pay attention. And a health professional in the survey wrote, well, I underestimated its importance to patients. And this Delphi survey is actually a very critical step in developing core outcomes because it enables this multi-directional knowledge exchange. It's not only just the patients learning about their you know, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, but health professionals also develop or gain awareness about the issues that are affecting patients. And it was quite interesting because we saw the scores for cardiovascular disease increase across the rounds for patients, and some patients were not on dialysis, were not aware that they were at an increased risk of cardiovascular events. It also can challenge the assumptions held by various stakeholder groups. As I've mentioned, mortality and hospitalization always more important to the clinicians or health professionals compared with the patients. And there is really a predominant focus on the impact of outcomes on lifestyle among patients. So we bring all the results from the prior phases into a consensus workshop to try and finalize the core outcome set. So this is the workshop for hemodialysis, and we 
discuss the proposed core outcomes, and there was some discussion around Dale's adequacy, because as you would note, that, that outcome sat quite high for both groups, and we were quite interested in, in why that was. <clears throat> so this gave us an opportunity to kind of deconstruct language and meaning, and this is really particularly evident for dialysis adequacy. Just to illustrate, the patient said, well, adequate means dialysis that's adequate for patients and caregivers to make me feel as normal as I can, but for doctors, it's a reduction ratio. When you ask about adequacy, I think, what's my quality of life once I'm leaving the dialysis session? During my treatments that day, am I going to feel well enough to continue on with my day as far as adequacy and my feeling well? Or am I going to feel tired? So the meaning of dialysis adequacy was really quite different for both groups. So just to show you the core outcome sets for each of the streams. So for hemodialysis, the core outcomes are fatigue, cardiovascular disease, vascular access, and mortality. And just to note that there are middle tier and outer tier outcomes that are also important. But our focus is on uh, identifying those core outcomes that we believe should be reported in all trials in hemodialysis because of their importance to patients and health professionals. So we have begun some work to look at, well, how do we actually measure these core outcomes? So for fatigue, we did a couple of systematic reviews. So we did a systematic review on what measures were currently used to assess fatigue in patients on hemodi receiving hemodialysis. So we found 123 trials and observational studies, and from these, we found 43 um, measures. And across these measures, there were 11 different dimensions of fatigue, content dimensions. So for example, the most frequent content dimensions were level of energy, tiredness, and the impact of fatigue on life participation. The SF36 was most frequently used, but this is a measure for quality of life and contains a subscale that addresses fatigue. But overall, there was very limited validation data for the use of a measure of fatigue in the hemodialysis population. We also did a systematic review or a thematic <coughs> synthesis pooling together all the qualitative studies on patients' experiences and perspectives of fatigue. In this, we identified 65 studies in involving over 1,700 patients on hemodialysis and identified a number of themes. So they talked about the debilitating and the exhausting burden of dialysis. So fatigue, the nature of fatigue is actually very unique uh, in, the dial in the hemodialysis population. One patient said, it feels like you're kind of hollow inside, like it's only a kind of shell that's functioning. It restricted their ability to do meaningful activities in their day-to-day -day lives, diminished their capacities to fulfill their roles in their relationships with family, social circles, and they felt very vulnerable to criticism and misunderstanding from others. Then we conducted a survey to find out, well, because there, there are multiple content dimensions within fatigue, and we wanted to develop a measure that's feasible, you know, three to five items in a measure that can be easily executed in all trials. So in terms of the most important content dimensions of fatigue, we conducted a best worst scale so we could assess the relative importance. And the top three were uh, impact of fatigue and life participation, level of energy and tiredness. Now, that, in this process, there was some debate. Health professionals were saying, well, it's that post-dialysis fatigue that's really important. But patients kept emphasizing, no, it's the general overall fatigue that I experience that impacts on my ability to do things. So one nephrologist said in the workshop, I was surprised that the post-dialysis fatigue was one of the lower and not higher ranked uh, dimensions. Maybe it's because I see patients during dialysis, but I've heard a lot more about post-dialysis fatigue, so that surprised me. That's going to be a learning takeaway point for me because it's important, but there's so much of that overall fatigue that we should be focusing on that. So this is the Song HD fatigue measure that we have developed based on the reviews, based on looking at what measures are already available. <coughs> And so this asked in the past week, did you feel tired, did you lack energy, and did fatigue limit your usual activities? 
and it's assessed on a four-point Likert scale from you know, not at all to severely. So we piloted this measure with patients on hemodialysis and have also just completed the validation work. So this, these results haven't actually been published yet. Um, so we validated this measure in the UK, in Australia, in Romania. It was all in English. It did demonstrate good internal consistency, good test retest reliability, and um, construct validity as well. Then we're also um, looking at a core outcome measure for uh, cardiovascular disease. And we con similarly conducted a survey to work out well, which cardiovascular disease is most important to the patients and health professionals. And it was MI and also sudden cardiac death. So we've had a consensus workshop around these outcomes. And last year at the ASN, we held a workshop with cardiologists, regulators, nephrologists to talk about the uh, definition for MI. That work is still ongoing. And now for vascular access. So vascular access function was determined to be the most important aspect of vascular access and defined as the need for interventions to maintain the use of vascular access for hemodialysis. And there is currently a study that's being conducted to validate um, the outcome measure for this. So just a quote from a patient who attended the vascular access consensus workshop, a functioning access means to me that I'm getting good health. For transplant, for those of you who may be interested, the core outcome domains are graft health, cardiovascular disease, cancer, infection, life participation, and mortality. So life participation was also another um, outcome that's emerged across some of the streams, also in peritoneal dialysis, defined as the ability to do meaningful um, activities of life. For PD, PD infection, cardiovascular disease, mortality, technique survival, and life participation. This one's not yet published. Um, so this, uh, it's kidney function, mortality, pain, and cardiovascular disease. So you can see some of the outcomes are actually uh, the same across the streams. And for Sonk, it's also unpublished. We just completed this one. And uh, it's life participation, survival, kidney function, and infection. And just a bit about implementing core outcomes sets in trials. A couple of years ago, we actually ran a consensus workshop with all the key stakeholders, including um, the NI funders, the NIH, uh, trialists, journal editors, regulators, patients, health, and also other health professionals to come together to work out ways and how we can actually implement core outcome sets. And we've come up with a, a multi-pronged approach through funding agencies, through trial networks, trial registries, journals, regulators, and also guidelines. And some sp specifics around this. Of interest, if you look at the UK uh, National Institutes for Health Research website, so they're um, the major funding agency there, they actually explicitly state in their um, guidelines for applicants where established core outcomes exist, they should be included amongst the list of outcomes unless there is a good reason to do otherwise. And interestingly, there was a specific health technology assessment um, or commissioning brief released by the NIHR for research on extended duration hemodialysis. And the outcomes that they specified in their documentation mapped onto the Song HD core outcome set. Some of you who are conducting trials may be familiar with the SPIRIT checklist. So this, the, this guidance is for developing the protocols for trials. <coughs> and they also state, where possible, the development and adoption of a common set of key trial outcomes within a specialty can help to deter selective reporting of outcomes and to facilitate comparisons and pooling of results across trials in a meta-analysis. And that trial investigators are encouraged to ascertain whether there is a core outcome set relevant to their trial, and if so, to include those outcomes in their trial. And just to note that Comet actually has a database of registered core outcome sets across different medical specialties. And some of you may have registered trials through the 
ISRCTN trial registry, which is the WHO and ICJ, ICMJE registry. And they also say you should refer to the Comet initiative and look in their database to see if there's core outcome sets available to include in the trials. In terms of regulators, in the UK, the NHS Health Research Authority, there is an expectation that core outcomes will be collected and reported. And the FDA medical devices development tools, I was speaking with um, someone from the FDA and they said you can actually embed some of these core outcome sets in the MDT, MDDT program. And some of the uh, European medicines agencies guidelines do specify core outcomes for different medical specialties. But specifically through the European Society of Transplantation, I'm actually working with their society who are developing guidance for the AMA about conducting trials in transplantation. And they will also explicitly include the song transplant core outcome sets and recommend the use of that um, for trials, to be reported in trials. And that's just a list to acknowledge all the endorsing organisations of the song initiative. And in summary, through this process, we've seen a mismatch in the priorities of, for outcomes between patients and health professionals, but it is possible to come together in consensus to identify those critically important outcomes. Patients want to be, want to be able to live well with kidney disease, rigorous systematic transparent methods for prioritization and consensus can help to identify and define outcomes and measures that are important to patients and their clinicians. It can also provide impetus for patient important trials. And one example I give is in, in dialysis, fatigue was the most important outcome. So we went on to ask patients, well, what are the sorts of things that you think can help you with fatigue, to help improve fatigue? And quite a number of them actually said, well, exercise. Ex when I exercise, that does help to reduce my fatigue. So we're now embarking on the MFIT trial, which is a structured exercise program for patients receiving dialysis, and it will be a preference adaptive trial design. And consistent reporting of these critically important core outcomes can better inform shared decision making and thus strengthen patient-centered care for people living with kidney disease. And I might just stop there and want to thank you very much for your time and attention.